The following program is a PodcastOne.com production. From Hollywood, California, by way of the Broken Skull Ranch, this is the Steve Austin Show. Give me a hell yeah. Hell yeah. Now, here's Steve Austin. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Steve Austin Show. I am coming to you from the main streets of Los Angeles, California, right here at the studio at 316 Gimmick Street. Coming to you with a little microphone on a stand in front of me. Got my little handy recorder, and I got a... Big-ass bottle of water right here. Room temperature, and I'm going to take this water in my hand, unscrew the lid, and take a swig for the working man. A swig of water for the working man and the working woman. And when you get off work, a swig of beer. How's that for you? Anywho, let's move on down the road. Hey, welcome to the Shizzo. I appreciate you guys hitting the download button. If you dig what you're hearing, hit the subscribe button if you like it after that tell two friends to tell two friends and so forth and so on that's how we got to spread the word like wildfire this some buck is heard around the world and y'all keep sending me emails whether it's questions suggestions comments insults anything you got send it to questions at steve austin show.com so i can answer you or at least get some feedback this show is like a big ass wrestling match and based on the information I receive, I can proceed accordingly to my next step. So keep sending in your feedback. I can't answer every damn uh, email. Uh, I try to do as much as I can. Some of them on the show, some of them by direct email, but I read them all. So I know where you're coming from, and I appreciate it. But this show is all over the world. So the, some of you cats that are way over there and in far off places, keep telling two people. And that guy over in China, if you can understand this, Tell a couple of your Chinese buddies and tell them to spread the word to help a brother out. Hey, speaking of help a brother out, I want to thank Aunt Evans over there at the UFC. I want to thank Dana White over at the UFC for hooking a brother up, me, with two tickets to UFC 170. I drove down to Vegas in the worst traffic I've ever driven down to Las Vegas, and I don't know what in the flying hell was going on but it was wall-to-wall, bumper-to-bumper traffic for 250 miles. I'm talking about some of the worst-ass, damn-damn, stupid, dumb drivers I've ever seen in my life. I know they didn't listen to the Steve Austin show because more of them would have been in the right-hand lane. Anyway, I finally made it into Las Vegas, checked into the hotel, had a damn good stay, and, hell, Stephen Bonner came to my room on Saturday morning. Yeah, he just got finished with his workout and we hooked up and opened up a can of audio whoop ass talking about his career and what he's up to now. It was a good uh, talk, and uh, I enjoyed talking to him because I met uh, Stephen Bonner at the uh, WWE event at the Staples Center a couple of weeks ago. So we got a chance to hook up, got some business taken care of. I can actually say I can write this trip off because I'm here doing business. But anyway, the task at hand was to go down to the UFC 170 and watch Daniel Cormier make his debut in the light heavyweight division, dropping down from the heavyweight division, going into that 205-pound class. And I tell you what, people already know about Daniel Cormier as a heavyweight, as a light heavy, double dangerous. So it's going to be real interesting to see what happens for D.C. from here on out because he was supposed to take on Sugar Rashad Evans, who has a hellacious uh, uh, career in the UFC and is a damn good fighter. But Sugar Rashad Evans didn't make the fight. He was injured in training camp, so they got a guy named Patrick Cummins to take this fight on a real short notice. And as good as he did, as much trash as he talked, he could not back that trash talk up. Once that bell rang, an octagon D.C. had been rubbed the wrong way. And D.C. don't like to be rubbed the wrong way. And so it ended very quickly. Daniel Cormier wins his debut fight at 205. Congratulations, brother. I look forward to uh, seeing you again. And look forward to seeing you as you make your way up into title contention, uh, of which I have no doubt you will be there very soon. Probably, if not another fight, maybe two. But other than that, championship match coming up for D.C., in my opinion. But what do I know, folks? Hell, I'm just a dumbass pro wrestler trying to talk about audio whoop-ass and make entertainment for the working man and the working woman. Hey, man, speaking about the UFC 170, that was a great main event, a uh, short main event. Ronda Rousey versus Sarah McMahon, two Olympians. One a wrestler, one a judo player. Uh, I tell you what, when you watch Ronda Rousey walk to the ring with that walk she does, that's a BMF walk. When they play Bad Reputation uh, by Joan Jett, Ronda Rousey comes down 
and she has that BMF walk, and she means business, and she takes care of business, mister. She imposed her will on Sarah McMahon, and I thought Sarah McMahon, she tried to stand up and trade uh, blows with Ronda Rousey, and I think, man, just play to your strengths and go for the double leg right off the bat. Single leg, double leg, just go down and try to take Ronda Rousey off her feet. But I think she kind of played to Ronda Rousey's strengths, which is just Ronda Rousey moving forward, destroying things. So anyway, uh, uh, Ronda Rousey caught her with a knee in the liver slash solar plexus. Uh, Sarah McMahon went down. Herb Dean made the stoppage. Maybe I would have liked to have seen that stoppage five or ten seconds later, but nonetheless, uh, you know, Herb Dean's a fine referee. And uh, short main event, uh, Ronda Rousey remains undefeated. And so now who has the blueprint? Who has the, the guts, the determination, uh, the game plan, and the skill set to take Ronda Rousey down? I don't know. It's going to be interesting. I really thought McMahon could pull the upset if she kept taking Rousey down, frustrating her, and just trying to stay on top of her. Not really so much of a ground and pound, just taking her down. But that didn't happen, and I had a good time. Once again, thanks to my boy, Aunt Evans. Thanks to Dana White. Hey, I was there, man. When I got on my Twitter account after the fights, I said, uh, that when I got on my Twitter account after the fights, I saw a bunch of people that had seen me on the front row. And they said, man, Austin looks like he's hammered. Austin's drinking too much at the UFC. Austin clearly off his rocker. Man, what are you talking about having too much to drink at the UFC? You ever tried to get a beer at a UFC event? Those gals are serving so much beer, it's hard to get their attention. I was yelling, waving my damn arms, and every time one of those girls passed by with about 10 beers on a tray, I was just slobbering like Pavlov's dog, you know, like drooling. There's a big pile of drool right there underneath my seat. It's hard to get a beer there because the girls are working so hard because the UFC draws a thirsty crowd. I know. I'm an eyewitness. I experienced. I was one of the thirstiest cats inside that building. Next time I go to a UFC event, I'm going to BYOB. I'm going to bring my own cooler and bring my own beer. What do you think about that, Ann Evans? Are y'all going to stop me? Are y'all going to get me some beer? Anyway, I didn't have too much beer, man. I was having a damn good time, man. They got the music, got the vibe, got the good action in the octagon. A couple of guys come down to some ACDC songs. Sarah McMahon came down to uh, Disturbed, Indestructible, Aranda, Bad Reputation, Joan Jett. I mean, man, it's hard not to groove to music like that. So anyway, man, I was just having a good time, man, chilling, drinking some beers. I enjoyed the fight game. My next door neighbor at the fight, the guy sitting next to me, was Uriah Faber. Man, I've been a Uriah Faber <laughs> fan for a long time. And it's funny, before he started sitting next to me, his buddy was sitting right next to me. And I looked over at him, and Uriah looks at me, and I, he sticks his hand out, and I stick my hand out, and he goes, Uriah. And as soon as he said Uriah, I said, Uriah. And I said, I know who you are. Jesus Christ, I don't think he knew how big of a fan I was of the MMA. So we sat there and shot the breeze the entire night. And I've been meaning to go up to Sacramento to the super training gym to get some more health and uh, weightlifting tips from Mark Smelly Bell over at super training gym. And when I get out to Sacramento and talk to Smelly Bell, I'll get over there and see if I can line up a can of audio whoop ass to be opened by myself and Uriah Faber over at the team alpha male camp because they're operating out of the same city. And then while I was sitting there, here comes old KL Sonnen to say hello and I guess he'd come back from Brazil. The Ultimate Fighter's done wrapped up shooting. And uh, he looked like a million bucks, looked in good shape. I think I could have took him down if I wanted to. He wasn't ready for it. Boy, I shot the damn single on him and took Kill down and tried to put him in an arm bar. All right, I'm just kidding. It sounded good, though, didn't it? Had a great time at the UFC. But I tell you what, man, uh, people out there are crazier than, uh, crazier than hell. I got to watch my damn language because it's a family-friendly show. We went out for a steak dinner. What's that place called? Charlie Palmer Steakhouse? Maybe I got it wrong. It was at the Four Seasons. And, uh, man, I just wanted to get a ribeye and some uh, spinach and get out of Dodge because I was kind of been on a little bit of a diet getting ready for the Broken Skull Challenge, which we're going to roll cameras on in about 10 days. I think we go to camera on March 3rd or March 4th, bringing the toughest badasses in America to the Broken Skull Ranch to compete against each other and to get the opportunity to run my personally designed obstacle course, the Skull Buster, the obstacle course that was specifically designed to whip a man's ass. We fixed to go to camera to do that. So trying to watch what I was eating. I, I know y'all saw me drinking all that Bud Light at the Octagon, but when it came time for dinner, I just wanted a steak, 
some uh, spinach and get out of there. Turns out the chef was a big fan. He starts sending all this stuff to the table. And the guy starts putting all this stuff on the table like, hey, man, we didn't order that. It was my, myself and my wife. He goes, no, it's compliments of the chef. Well, okay. Well, man, the compliments of the chef is he sent out some sushi. He sent me out a big-ass salad. He sent out some all gratin potatoes, Brussels sprouts, a couple other damn things. By the time I got my ribeye, I was about ready to tap out myself. But anyway, uh, thanks to everybody over there. Had a damn good meal. They cooked the steak just perfect. And they actually had an IPA beer uh, on the selection of beer. And I can't remember what kind of beer it was, but it was damn good. If I remember the name, I'd give it a shout out. But uh, maybe I'll get my wife to come in here and hit me in the head with a steel chair and jar some of these memories. But anyway, swig a beer for all the people over at UFC. And you crazy some bucks in Las Vegas. Uh, I was glad to get out of Las Vegas. It don't take me too long to get enough of that city. It's a great city. But, uh, you know, it don't take me long to get a gut full. Thanks to Stephen Bonner, who came by on Saturday and opened up a can of audio whoop ass. That show will be coming up in the near future. And, again, uh, Lillian Garcia coming up on the Thursday show. Hey, guys, if you ain't picked up a Steve Austin show audio whoop ass T-shirt yet, you need to go to podcastone.com right now because we're giving all you working men and working women a special break. For the next two weeks, the T-shirts are only fourteen ninety-five. Special discount for the next two weeks. Steve Austin Show, audio whoop-ass T-shirts. Go to podcastone.com, click on the store link, and get yourself one of these badass black T-shirts today. Take advantage of our special deal while it lasts. <sighs> Man, I take me a damn breath of fresh air right here. Y'all know I got Steve Regal, William Regal coming up. My old buddy, my old travel partner, a uh, guy I used to love to work with and basically just travel with, man. We had so many good times uh, back in the day. And so some of the stuff I can't talk about, <laughs> but we we do talk about the stuff we, we can talk about. That's coming right up. This is the Steve Austin Show. Here is my conversation with my buddy, Lord William Regal. Lord William Regal. I call him Steve Regal. What do you like to be called? I don't care. All right. Steve's fine. Bollocks. Bollocks is good, yeah. Hey, uh, let's go back to the time uh, when I met you at uh, yeah. Center Stage TV. You just come in. I was like, man, William Regal or whatever they're calling you. You came in as William Regal? No, I came in as Steve, Steve, Steve Regal. Regal. Yeah. So that, that was the Lord thing when you got with Dundee. That was later right. on, right? Yes. But I remember you came in. I can't remember who he's working with, and I, I and I watched you work. Like you were selling your ass, and I came up and I stuck my hand mm-hmm. down. Hey, man, Steve Austin, mm-hmm. man, nice to meet you. It was badass work. Uh, I just love the way you sold. And you had been working at that point, probably ten years. Nearly ten years, yeah. So, well, so what got the bug up your ass? I mean, you, you're working your ass off in England. You come up the hard way, kind of learning the carnies, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah, an incredible technician, and you said, hey, I'm picking up my bags, I'm going to the United States of America. Well, What spurred that decision? It started off in England, and I didn't think I'd go any further. I was quite happy working on the fairground. Honestly, I thought, because I had Man, no it had been fun, but it had been tough. It, it was, but it, I didn't, didn't feel tough at the time, because it, I was 16, playing at yeah. being wrestlers, living in Wonderland, and it was Wonderland to me. I was, you know, like, biggest amusement park in Britain. I, I'm wrestling on it and, and just living in that scene yeah. when it was still alive, you know. Yeah. So I went down a lot in the in the 90s and stuff, but it, in the 80s it was still buzzing. There's shows on everywhere. There's clubs. It was just a great place to be. And I had no athletic ability. I wanted desperately to be a wrestler, but I, I, I wasn't any good. You know, I was lucky to get uh, a break. No, but to hear that. But I had no athletic ability. I was no good at it. Luckily, I got a break to get in it got in it and then like my, my view sort of changed I was quite happy working there then I think well I'm slowly getting a bit better perhaps I can work on the bigger circuits in England and I worked on that and then when I got to about 18 I started looking oh well, probably a bit yeah about 18 I started seeing Dave Taylor and, and Tony Sinclair and Pete Roberts was my big idol right um 
and they were never in England much. That you'd see them occasionally on shows, and they always seemed to have a suntan, and they were always just coming back from somewhere sounding exotic to me. And and they were like this small group of British heavyweight wrestlers that were world renowned for for being really technically sound. And they'd fly right. they'd fly them in to make everybody look good and look like they could wrestle, you know, and do these long drawn out wrestling matches that people can't do anymore, you know, like between eight or 15 five-minute round wrestling matches right. and put people in and out of things and right. all that. And so I thought, I want, I'd like to be... That just sounded like the best job in the world, you know, because they weren't stars anywhere. They were just... But they made a lot of money doing... A lot of money for, for England right, right. standards. And they were always away. And I thought, that's what I want to do now. So then I started learning that kind of stuff. And luckily for me, because I was tall, I started get heavier, you know, because it was always a bit of a... like a the heavyweights did that, right. and a lot of the other fellas didn't. Like the big stars in England were all smaller fellas, really. Right. It was the way it was, and uh, so that was that. And so from twenty, I got onto that kind of run from twenty to twenty-four. But but let me let me stop you right there. All of the guys, the 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 difference when you watch, you know, guys who just start in America versus guys who start in England. I mean, yes. it's a European the flavor, the style is completely different. Yeah. And a lot of, you know, the, the arm stuff, the reversals of mm-hmm. the roles, I, I don't even know how to describe it because I don't speak technical European wrestling uh, uh, jargon. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's always interesting to see, and, and you can see a lot of uh, your, your influence or at least some European influence in Daniel Bryan yeah. uh, who can do a lot of that stuff. Yeah. And obviously he's having a great run right now, and I know you guys are, are really good friends. Uh, but but why is it – that you guys were just just. Uh, Do you want to know what the, the, I, th- I think it is? I've tried to figure it out. Yeah, I mean, first you know thing, what I'm trying to say. First thing starts with the rules. The first thing starts with the rules. An open punch, you were disqualified gotcha. instantly. Okay, and, so, and and y'all enforced the enforced rules. Enforced the rules. Go go. So that's where the uppercuts come in. Right. That was where that it was like strikes and uppercuts. That okay. Way. The next thing that I think it comes from is the technical stuff is because the rings were so small 14 foot most of them and wow. rock hard right and so you had to you, you couldn't be flying around doing a lot of you gotta that put your kind time in you got to tell a different kind of story and it was also a matter of putting on only so many matches on the card right they used to most cards used to only have four matches Right. So everybody had to put time in, and the, and it was just the way that it started with the rounds. The rounds were already in place. Yeah. Well, it just seemed to be that way because I mean, believe me, I'm I'm the big protector of British wrestling, and right. and, and and the, the and, you know I, I uh, that's what I do and try and keep it. But if you go back and watch a lot of it, it was rotten. There was a lot. There was incredibly good, brilliant technical wrestlers but most of the big stars weren't they weren't technically sound really but it's funny because when yeah. i saw you come to the united states i could watch you go out with a guy who'd really literally been in a business for a couple of months and as long as you could ha- hang on to that guy's arm and put yourself in reversals yeah. and come out of it and, and go down and do the things with him i mean you could take a, a guy who was green as grass and have a pretty damn good match with him due to all that knowledge due to that stuff well that there was a, several different types of wrestling in England. There was the, the every and every weight class had a, had a championship belt. Right. So you had your lightweights, middleweights, mid heavyweights, heavyweights. Um, the lightweight guys were and Johnny Saint and Steve Gray. Johnny Saint will say that his style is what he calls escapology style, which is it's purposely it, it's it's a show style of getting in and, and doing fancy things to get out of them. So Johnny Saint does this escapology style. It's it's you, you, where you, it's really technically getting in and out of holds, and but there's not a lot of aggression going on. It's, it's right, very right. fancy looking. Tip or ten almost. Yes, and it's and but that's the style of it. Right, that's I get it. it I, I like watching his work. Yeah, it's fantastic stuff, and and he does it incredibly well. It's it's bad when people try to copy his stuff because right. it just never looks right. You know, there's certain ways you have to be taught this, um, and then. The middleweight, the heavy middleweights, especially that was the Mark Rocco and, and Marty Jones that popularized that style. I mean, uh, and, and well, man, would you the, describe that as, as a technical 
that's uh, high speed cruiserweight style. Yes, that's and that's where it all uh, started. Battering ram and type stuff too. I mean, incredible. Yeah. And and anybody stuff that, stuff that trans, would translate to Japan. Yeah, well, it, it was taken to Japan. And yeah. People people get it all mixed up and say that it was it was Tiger Mask that started that and Dynamite. It wasn't. Right. You go back and watch Marty Jones and Mark, and I say this a lot, but you go back and watch them in from 76, 77, 78. They were doing stuff then that nobody had ever seen. Right. They invented that style, and it was it was that heavy wrestling-based style with very physical, because you know, a lot of the lightweight stuff wasn't so physical, very physical because they didn't like each other. Right. And so they were always trying to out-top each other. and they were Straight up shoot. Yeah. They yeah. Were not, they, you know, Very competitive. They, every other one, they'd be yeah. putting one into each other just because they'd grown up together right. and, and they didn't like each other. And they, had, they, they evolved this style. And then Dynamite came along when he was a kid. And he had a very technically, incredibly British style. But then he obviously he got started doing that stuff, must have picked it up off them. And, that, and it went, and then Tiger Mask came to England as Sammy Lee in the in the late seventies, and he had his own style, but brought and it was all this mixture of styles, but they they were the ones that the Mark and, and Marty were the two that set it all off, and then Tiger Mask like Sammy Lee went back to Japan, became Tiger, Mask, took Rocco over there as his ne nemesis, Black right. Tiger, yeah. and that's where it became popular, and everybody thought it started then, but then there was the heavyweights. Now there was the the show heavyweights, the Big Daddy and the Giant A Stacks, which yeah, were yeah. the big monsters and stuff. But then there were the very incredibly sound, technically skilled heavyweights. But they weren't big stars in England. That was they funny. were the ones that went overseas because yeah. they were in demand in Germany and, and, right. and Africa and, and India. And that they, were and the they wanted to see the more work aspect yes. rather and than they, the attraction guys yes. like Haystacks yes. and, and uh, big, big Daddy. Yeah, and so you would, you would, these, these heavyweight guys that I became a part of, they were they were basically trunks and boots guys with they short technicians. Haircuts, technicians that could go at, and they were in demand all over the world because right. they could trust bring these they could work in. yes and that was it and work with anybody right. and put anybody in and out of things and make them look like they could wrestle whether they could or couldn't which was a big skill to have and they were always in demand and they always had a lot of work because the the thing was you what you wanted to be if you were in england if you were everywhere you wanted to go to germany you were in Germany. You always talk about Germany. I know yeah. Fit went over a whole yes. lot. Fit Finley, a good friend of yours, and a guy who I have yeah. so much respect for. What was the deal with Germany? Well, Germany was six months of the year. I don't want. Otto Vance, yeah, and right. the CWA. You would start off in, when I was doing it, you would start off for three weeks in uh, Graz in Austria. It was running tournaments. So you were in the same building for weeks at a time yeah. with no traveling and a lot more money. Probably yeah. three times the money that you would be making in England. And how were the houses? Oh, through the week, not so good. Tuesday nights was always good because it was free ladies and they always had some kind of beer promotion on. Yeah. And then, like, Wednesdays wouldn't be good. But weekends, they may have, like, a special thing on a Thursday. Right. Friday, Saturday would always be very good. Sunday was always some kind of a gimmick thing, like a chain match or something they'd built yeah, up yeah, to. Yeah. So, you know, there was... How was Otto as a promoter? I thought he was a, obviously a very smart guy to, to, to work. To Everybody I've to talked to that was there loved it. Yeah, I mean, it, so you were there. And the lifestyle was kind of... It was incredible, yeah. right? You'd go for three weeks in Graz, which is a beautiful city, yeah. right? And you all lived in, you lived like the circus. You, you lived in, in trailers, caravans. And you either, some of the places were in a, like, a, like in Germany, were in a big tent, like a circus tent. And you'd be on a big, like a big car park and you could park your caravans next just like the circus next to the tent yeah or if you were in austria you'd be in these beautiful campsites in the middle of these mountains with lakes and stuff yeah and then we have to be at the in the building at, or in the in the dressing room at seven o'clock well six thirty it's time to drive over to the leave the campsite and you'd be living on these campsites go to the gym hang out by the lake all day or the pool it was a hell of a lifestyle you know Sit and barbecue your food, and it was just good. So you have three weeks in Graz, then you do seven weeks in Vienna. Well, seven weeks in Vienna is about as good as it ever gets through the summer, right? It's the most beautiful city in Europe. Then you'd go into Hanover in Germany and do nine weeks there, and then you'd do five weeks, right, take you up to Christmas in Bremen. It was a hell of a lifestyle, right? So no traveling, basically. Um... The best of the best people to work with. Right. 
very good money for that period. Now, were y'all working straight matches or were y'all doing the five minute rounds? It was all. Uh, in, see, in, that when I watch World of Sport, a lot yes, of five minute rounds. Yes, it, in, in England it was five minute rounds and it's like sometimes three minutes, but usually five minutes, either six or eight five minute rounds. In Germany it was five four minute rounds mm -hmm. with the. The original, because it was run in tournaments over, you know, say there was 20 fellas, you'd all wrestle each other over so many times, depending how long the tournament was, right. and, they, and that kind of a thing. And then, like, there'd be a tag match every night, that wouldn't, you wouldn't, that wouldn't be included in the tournament right. points and all that. So that now, would they run a tag match straight through? Yes. Okay. And, but the five four-minute rounds, they would, that was the, the, the normal match in Germany. Well, if you went through a draw with somebody, then you did another match with them, and then they would have extra time maybe right. a, a, like you'd have a five four minute round and if you went a draw again you'd have an extra 10 minutes at the end of it or sometimes an hour match you know there'd be like these different things to, to make it interesting for the, the people coming that these tournaments ran like that that's how they sort of worked when i first started watching the world of sports stuff the five minute rounds kind of first for me because i grew up all in american mm -hmm. style wrestling usually run straight through yep. times time and uh, many times under all uh, six minutes, you know, whatever. And so you go to the the five minute rounds. I'm like, oh man, this kind of throw me for a loop. But then I really started studying it. And each five minute round, I mean, it's like a mini match. Yes. I mean, because you've got built in psychology in five minute spurts. Yes. And you know how one guy comes. And, you know, maybe maybe it's a, maybe someone catches a fall or he's hurt the other guy. Get the, it's what's a minute break between rounds. Yes. And so it's very intriguing once you get into when it and watch, well. hey, man, these guys are working their ass off. I mean, they're doing the great stuff in the ring uh, and a lot of the technical stuff because I was watching the lighter weight guys go. But just within the, the, the framework of each five-minute period, you know, and, and you know, they know where they're going with it depending on how many rounds they make and do they go the distance. But what happens in each little setup, dude? Yeah. I mean, that's a lot of damn planning and doing that for – I don't know how many weeks in a row, uh, you know, whether you're doing the five, uh, four minute rounds or in England doing the five minute rounds. But man, if you're working every single night, you're damn sure getting your chops in. Yes. Like uh, crazy. A lot of reps. It will really make you. <laughs> I mean, if you have the ability to acclimate and, and be talented, if you can't learn there, you can't learn anywhere. You can't learn but anywhere. it's tough. Yeah. Uh, well, it didn't seem it. It was just. Well, well yeah, because you were used to it. But okay, check yeah. this out. So finally. Uh, what was the big decision so saying, then, let me pack up and well, get to the States? Because I just want to ask yeah. about the, 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 transition the transition between yeah. going from rounds to our system when well, you, you came you, into Steve Regal. You know I waffle on a bit, right? So there's always no, a no, hug no. back still. No, no, bit. good. We, I got the recorder running. It, it's, uh, I was doing all that stuff. So from 20 till 24, I was, I was never at home. I right. was literally wrestling in England maybe two months of the year. And I was living there, but I was off all the time. The last year I was there, 92, I was there for... I was in England for two months. I was away for nine months. What did your dad think when you hauled off and, and took off? I mean, was he was he behind you? He think he's going to fall on your face? Wanted you to get a regular job? He wanted me to take over his his construction right. business and be a bricklayer. You yeah. know, and I just knew from a little kid. Did you break his heart, or he was cool and yeah, supported you? No, he bro yeah. broke his heart, and and it, but he's, he's always supported me. Oh yeah, you know, he's just a, he's a great fella, and he's always. But I still think to this day, he still thinks I'm going to go back and. Take, go back and yeah. start up his business again, you know. Yeah. So I got like traveling and I was just nonstop traveling and I was doing all this stuff. And then 1991, out of the blue, I get a, a FedEx come to my house from the WWF. I didn't even know what a FedEx van was or a FedEx. I'm sat in my house <laughs> and a van pulls up outside. I had a few things in my house that shouldn't have been in there. Let's put it that way. Because um, it was all, you know, just the life and the people I on ground with were always buying and selling things. And, you know, like, and not not bad things, just yeah, yeah, yeah. video recorders and stuff. Yeah. And that and that was part of just to, to get through life. That's what I did. And I, I thought it was the SWAT team come to get me. <laughs> so I'm panicking. I, I, I see a van pull up outside, you know, with with writing on that I had no clue what it was I thought oh here we go yeah it's off now right yep. <laughs> so I'm like, caught up to I'm, me. I'm sticking stuff under the couch and everything like <laughs> just trying to ram stuff up <laughs> in the attic and there's a knock at, oh here we go and it was just left this this letter on the this FedEx from the WWF can you come to the Royal Albert Hall so um, you opened it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah right so, oh, it's, it's, well I looked on the back and it yeah. said WWF oh all right this yeah is, yeah so now, what year was that? That was 91. Okay. So I get this, uh, can you come to the Royal Albert Hall? We'd like to look at you. 
where's wow. this come from? This is like, like a punch in the face, right? Yeah. You know, a good punch a good in the punch face. A good punch face, yeah. So I go down there, and I get down there, and I have a match at the Royal Albert Hall. I don't know if you've ever seen that. It was something they put on, the, it was like a, a special show for England, and they did a Battle Royal, and Davy Boy won the Battle yeah. Royal. And, that. and then they asked me to go to Wembley the next night, and they talked to me there, and they said, look, and that was in the days when everybody had a character and everybody they said, look, we like you. It could be several years till we get back in touch, but we will keep in touch, but we right. like you and we'll find the right thing for you. Because I was only, well, this one would have been 20, 21, 22, 22 maybe. Yeah. I said, great. A couple of weeks later, I get a call. WCW was on like late night TV in England. Can you come and do work for us? This was November of 91. Still to this day, don't know how I got that. I think it was Scott Hall, because right. I knew Scott from 1989 in Germany. I spent Jesus, a yeah. couple of months with him there. I don't know who suggested me. I still don't know. How did he do over in England? I mean, over in, in Germany. Germany, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. He was, he was always he was a good brilliant. worker. He brilliant, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He was Texas Scott Hall. And he yeah, yeah. He with a big cowboy work. hat and big mustache. Yeah, People loved him. And yeah, he was good looking dude. And he fit right in there, yeah. you know, because he, 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 he knew exactly how to, to, to do his stuff and, and to fit in with everybody. So I don't know. He's, I've asked him and he's never admitted, yeah. he never said one way or the other. But anyway, so I go and basically Giant A Stacks was there and they wanted to look at him. And I wrestled with Giant A Stacks all the time, hundreds of times, right? So they wanted me to look, wrestle him, and then they said, can you stay for the rest of the week because somebody's hurt or something. I, I still never found out what. So I'm like, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll stay with you. So we did a couple of days in London, and, and then we did a, a show in Sheffield, and then we did a show in Dublin. And in that week, I wrestled Terry Taylor, Jimmy. That had have been fun. You guys had incredible, a yeah. And we'd never, you know, because we, that, you know what, what wind, winds me up a lot when people say, Oh well, I've got a different style. I never had when I I never had any problems working with any of them fellas that from that era of group that knew how to work exactly. Right, it's nonsense. It's all nonsense. It's people who've never learnt the job properly. Yeah. If I turn your arm one way, it goes that way, and if you turn, I go that way, and if you hit me, I I sell it that way. Right. That that's, and so there's anybody who gets that. that there's a point when well it has a difference it's just people who don't know what they're doing really right. and they make excuses for their lack of abilities right. right so i had a great week i worked with michael hayes terry garvin terry taylor uh giant a stacks the one day and then oz i worked with kevin when he was still oz yeah how was that oh double red rotten yeah <laughs> <laughs> No, it was it was okay, you know. Yeah. I mean, it was just he was he was not he had you know he was still trying to find himself at that point, wasn't he? He wasn't sure, and that was a terrible gimmick he was given. But you know, yeah. I remember being in Dublin. Anyway, so they said at the end of the week, "Well, we like you, we want you to come." So I'm thinking, well, whoever gets hold of me first, right? Because I'd seen the writing on the wall by right. then. You saw American TV. I mean, American shows were on TV in England now. Once you've seen that. You don't want to go back to watching, uh, you know, a little ring with a hundred watt light bulb above it. Right, it's just the way it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's fun uh, for a while. Fun for a while, and, and, and all of a sudden you get a taste of it. They get and yeah. see that production and everything. And I wanted to come to America. You know, I mean, I always wanted yeah. to come to America. Everybody does, right? Well, most people do. So now it's looking like a, a natural chance for me to come. So I go about my business the next year, ninety two. I am absolutely book solid. I worked the first two months in in England every single night. It was on fire. There was no the TV had been World of Sport had been taken off TV in 1988, and it went through a few ups and downs. Why did it get taken off TV? There was a lot of it to do with the promotion and not making any any new stars. That was one thing, but that's not everything. Basically, a fella called Greg Dyke, who now is the head of the BBC, came to ITV and he decided that wrestling and 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 you know darts is a bit professional darts is a big thing in oh England yeah yeah and snooker um things like that were too working class he wanted to, he was a, a fella you know an uh, oxford educated or cambridge ed educated fella he wanted to upgrade everything and thought that the working classes which is most of britain that watch tv yeah because it's such a big class system he thought he knew better than they did uh. right? so first thing he did was move wrestling in a two-year spell. He moved wrestling from 
four o'clock in the afternoon, which it was always on, regular spot, yeah. four o'clock on a Saturday. This would be a saying in England, everything stopped at four o'clock. That's the working class. That, that, so I was serious about the wrestling. Yeah, see, yeah. Working classes watch wrestling. Yeah. Right? Moved it from four o'clock to, to midday in 1986. Everybody, not everybody, but most factories, everything else, everything worked half day on a Saturday in that period yeah. of time till till 12.30. That was yeah, a, yeah. a work week in England, yeah. five and a half days a week. Within a week of them moving it from four o'clock till 12, the figures dropped in half just really? for the time spot. And then there was a lot of other things that went in with, the, you know, not making any new stars and... and, and you know, all kinds of stuff, production values and whatever else. Yeah. But within two years of watching the figures drop off, you've got perfect excuse to just take it off, right? Right. When it was took off, it was still getting four point something million. Yeah, Jesus. It was still getting, and people yeah. would die for that now, right? Four point yeah. something million. You know, main shows on a Saturday night don't get that. And, yeah. and that was when they took it off. So then what happened to the wrestling scene there in England if they didn't have a TV? It, it went underground for a while. It, it, um, a lot of people lost, had to get jobs. You yeah. know, um, Brian Dixon, uh, who was the what we used to call the opposition promoter, um, he sort of came into his own. Then Dale Martins, who ran the TV, um, sort of went went away to a, a big degree. Brian Dixon kept running shows and just and he had all the best talent that was there right. and just kept running and running. Right. And everything was posters and word of mouth anyway. Right. Regular buildings, every you know, through the winter. You did most places you did every month or every and two kept weeks. Going. And kept it going. And so it, it, it fluctuated a bit. But by 92, we, 91, 92, everything was on fire again. All the No TV and all the buildings were doing incredibly well. Now, they're only small buildings, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, between three business, and, business and yeah, 5,000 people. But yeah. I, like I was on the, in the beginning of, uh, 92 it was Dave Taylor against Fit Finlay chasing for the British Championship chasing each other on one tour mm. Ryan had two shows a night right. and then the other show was uh, Kendo Nagasaki in a, in a tag match with whoever he was and, and whoever else was right. fitting in there so you'd be going between the two uh, I was at that time there was a remember Evad Sullivan Dave Sullivan yeah Right, well, he was over there. Uh, he'd been in Germany, and he came to England, and I was on a few shows with him. Like, so we were just sort of moving around between the two tours and just busy all the time. Or, or I'd be, some nights I'd be on with, in the Nagasaki tags, me and right. whoever, and Pat Roach and against them too, and uh, whoever. Like, it was always working. Um, and then March the 1st of that year, I went to India for a month, and then I went to Germany on for a about 10 days, and I went to South Africa, then I went to Egypt, and luckily, I, I hadn't got any work booked for, the, Germany was very, very hard to get in, it was a very close, right, right clicky, everybody, yeah. clicky, everybody right. wanted the spot there, now I'd had, I'd had bits of it here, there, and everywhere, and I get a cut, I, I'm just sat at home, I've got the summer, you know, I've got, got it booked up in England and stuff, right. but I hadn't got a lot else, I don't know, I had plenty of work coming up in September, I was going to go, all kinds of place I forget but I get a call from Otto Vance can you start in uh, Graz next week or in three days I think at the start of his tour for the rest of the year yeah well, well Steve Wright um, Alex Wright's dad he was fixing an air deal on his roof and fell off and broke his leg or so, done something he was a wrestler yeah okay. he was like a, he was so a Alex second star. generation yeah, yeah so he was a big star you know yeah. his dad he was, he was one of their mainstays well, been interesting. I didn't know for that. 20 odd years yeah or you want to watch, there's a match of his, his dad, you want to talk about technical wrestlers, his dad against Tiger Mask from Japan. Alex, I mean... Uh, uh, Steve Wright. Steve Wright he versus Tiger Mask. He eats Tiger Mask's lunch really? for 20 minutes. Gives him nothing, not a drink of water. Really? Oh, yeah. yeah and he just used, that's what he used to be like with everybody. It was like ride of your life trying to wrestle. Right. Him. He was so fit and so in, in incredible condition. If you look at him, you'd think, this fella, he don't look like nothing. Oh, I'm going to check would, it out. People would be scared to death of him. Because really? He would just, well, how big a fella was he? Not a big fella at all. But just was a, just just a was buzzsaw. Just a machine. Right. Just blow you up and drag you about and you wouldn't know what was happening. Straight up. Straight up. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so he gets in. Can you come? Yeah. So I ended up staying there through the rest of the year. September, 
Rip Rogers is on the tour. Yeah. Rip Rogers came in to my my trailer one day and said, uh, "Are you still in touch with WCW?" This is ninety two September. I said, uh, "Well, you know the old way." I don't know if this was like when you were starting, but the way we used to get booked everywhere, wherever you went, this was one of them tricks, wherever you went, you just send a postcard from Durban, South Africa, uh, hello, this is Steve Regal, just tell you I'm working here, and send it to all the promoters you knew, because it made you sound like you were in demand, right. which you were. Yeah. Well, he, he said, you still in touch with WCW? I said... And this is funny because WWE, I had a letter off them every month, no, sorry, every two months, came to my house in Blackpool set with a, a, a printed letter. We've got you on file whenever there's something comes. I was still getting those letters a year after I came to America. Who was sending those letters? Somebody in the okay. office, I don't know. Was but they were they was they maintained were in touch. Yes. Okay. Never heard anything off WCW because yeah, yeah. you know how unorganized that was, right? Yeah. So, but Rip Rogers said to me, can you... Uh, can you, have you got nice handwriting? And I went, well, yeah, it's the only, only one thing I ever did at school. You know, I've got nothing else but I can write. They'd, yeah. They'd, uh, my knuckles tell the tales of that because they used to, nuns used to batter us over the hands with like a cane if you know, maybe yeah. force you to write. So you get pretty like, handwriting. That's the only thing I've got yeah. right, is good handwriting. Uh, <laughs> so he said, Bill Watts has just took over WCW. He said, and I've worked for him and he's very, he said he'd like you. But he's very particular about certain things. He likes. He said, "You said when you because about every couple of months I would send out like a a, a printed resume, you know, like a, 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 and whatever, you know, just another eight because you never sent videos in them days. It was eight yeah. by tens, yeah, just a picture of you. Yeah, you know. that was all. Yeah, it was it eight by ten, and you and your resume, and I've worked here, there, yeah. here, there, here, you know, and you can call this fella for a reference. Yeah, this fella, that was the way it was. So he said." Uh, he said, this may sound strange, but if I dictate it to you, can you write it? He said, because he likes to hear certain words. I said, yeah, of course I can, yeah. So there's all these sayings like, I train diligently and, and this and that, I've, you know, this and that. Yeah. So I ripped this letter, I sent it, and used to have to, it was about an eighth of a mile walk from my caravan to the phone box to call home every day. You know? Yeah. So obviously, that was the way it was, a handful of coins and call yeah. back to the wife. I go and call about five days later, I call home one day. Um, she said, uh, can you call this number straight away? I sent this letter off that Ripper yeah. told me about. Um, he said, can you call this number? Bill Watts wants to talk to you straight away. So I get straight away put through from his secretary to him. I'm like in the phone box. Honestly, my hands was going in and out like a fiddler's elbow trying to put these coins in this yeah. thing like that <laughs> couldn't get enough coins yeah. in like just eating them up call, yeah. calling them don't America. hang up on me now yeah, yeah, calling yeah. from America right big pocket full of change and uh, he said uh, I'd like you to come and work for me can you can you come like like now and I, I said I, I'm sorry I can't I said I'm, I'm here till Christmas he said he went silent for a while and I, he went have you got a contract I said, no, but I, I've given me word that I'm going to be here till Christmas. And he went, and another long silence. I oh, thought, well, that's yeah. me screwed, but, you know, I've, that's the way I am. That's the yeah. way I do business. He went, you've definitely got the job now. Most people would have just quit to come here, he said, and I like that in somebody. He said that you didn't quit, you know, and you give your word. He said, that's sealed the deal. Uh, when can you, he said, I'll get you here. He said, when you're finished there, I said, well, two days before Christmas. He said, well, I'll get you here for the 1st of January. That's awesome. And then it was just a matter of my wife at home having to find that much, because I was in Germany finding that much stuff to get to send to get visas and stuff, yeah. and all these programs, everything that I'd ever done for the last 10 years. She had to find proof of that I was right. a wrestler, you know, to get these. It's easy, yeah. a lot easier for them to get visas now. And she was sending stuff. And by the time I, I went, um, I got here, you know, it, it, it's not that easy to get visas. Um, was the, I landed on the 23rd of January, and then the first day I met you was the 25th of January, 1993. The Steve Austin Show. The Steve Austin Show. Do you own a home or condo? Or perhaps you run a house or apartment? Sure you do. And Geico knows it can be hard work. Because whether you own or rent, you still have to fill it full of your stuff. Your furniture. The flat screen and all the boxes of stuff that have been sitting there ever since you moved in, but have it unpacked. It's hard to find the time, right? But you know what's easy? Bundling policies with GEICO. 
Geico makes it easy to bundle your homeowner's or renter's insurance along with your auto policy. That way, you'll rest easy knowing that your home and all your stuff is protected, like the furniture and that flat screen. Plus, getting a quote on homeowner's and renter's insurance is super easy through GEICO. It's a good thing, too, because you already have so much to do around your home. You know, like going through all those boxes of stuff. Visit GEICO.com, get a quote, and see how much you could save. It's GEICO easy. Visit GEICO.com today. That's GEICO.com. The Steve Austin Show. The Steve Austin Show. All right, back in business here, talking with Lord Stephen Regal, William Regal. Whatever I'm calling King you. Of tribe. King That's, of the Jabroni you tribe. King of the Jabroni tribe. You used to sing that song all the time to me. What was that all about? I don't know. Lord Stephen Regal, King, King of, of the, the Jabroni tribe. tribe. I don't know. You, you, you had all kinds of verses for it and everything. Dude, you actually put thought into it. Yeah. Different space at a different time. Yeah. We were on a bunch of different levels back then. We were both on <laughs> straight and narrow these days. <laughs> hey, man, what was your uh, favorite town to work? F- favorite town to work in? Anywhere in the United States. I used to like that place we used to do in Columbia, South Carolina. You know, Why'd you stage, like that? You know, there's like the stage yeah, yeah. and that. I watched you and Ricky I, I wrestle like 45 minutes one night in there. I don't know. It was weird that. It was just that little place. Yeah. But there was just an atmosphere to it. Yeah. I don't know why. It was just one of those places that I was... You know, you know, these great big arenas, but after a while they all become, you know, obviously Chicago and the garden yeah, places. Yeah. Are, but there's just the intimacy about that right. place was something magic about it i thought i i enjoyed back in the day when we were doing uh tv in atlanta because you know we just make those those towns i yeah. mean it was dothan uh, alabama it was columbus georgia it was macon georgia it was uh one of those couple of towns in south carolina that were kind of close by yeah the, we do those the, anderson greenville and anderson yeah yeah greenville and anderson um, and but yeah, everything was so local and, and those yeah. were kind of and i remember those days uh the buildings were usually half to three quarters full. Yeah, and those were television taping. So, yeah. uh, but you know, houses where the you know or where they were, the business wasn't the greatest uh, period of uh, you know we've seen. Uh, that what, was the best time. I think my favorite time period of my career was that that point in time when there was me and you were traveling. And we were on all those shows, what they called the B Crew. But it was oh like, man, the B Crew was rocking. It though. was ro- it was rocking. We had like, the best working team, and we were in all. And you go to like Florida, and we'd be base ourselves in Orlando, and we'd do all those little Davy, Florida, all these little towns for like ten days, and we'd come back do TV in Atlanta. And then we'd do the Carolinas for for a week or two, and then we'd do the Georgia show. But those ones when we were away, and we sort of me and you were doing them drives and. And you just go and you, you you'd work hard and you would come out and you'd be sweating and you you know you it was just magic. Uh, it was, and the business was a lot more simple back in it seemed. So I mean, it's a giant do, machine. Do I was, your thing, right? And yeah. And do you do yeah? Your get stuff. a shower and get down the road. Yeah. Remember back in the day when we was filming uh, TVs in Orlando, Florida? You and me used to stay out in the hotel at Kissimmee, yeah. and there was that uh, British pub, Rovers Return. We Rovers you and me would always go, yeah. man. We get loaded up on Guinness, throw darts all throw night darts, long, yeah. go back to the hotel and, yeah. and do it all again, and that that was uh, so some great times. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was uh, your favorite match, uh, or, or just a list of a couple of matches that are your favorite of all time? That I've had? No, no, just any match that you would like to watch, watch. that you've liked to watch. My favorite match of all time was the the match that's on, you can watch it on YouTube, is Marty Jones against Mark Rocco from 1978. Marty's wearing red tights. That's my favorite match. Um, then those 89... Flair Steamboat matches. Yeah, I used to. I, I got those on tape, um, and I used to do my squats to watching them. Yeah, that one hour match. I used to put that on, and I used to just stand and do do in do squats Hindus. watching it, or step ups. Yeah, um, weird. But I used to do that, and I thought, well, if I can do this, I can keep up with them. Right, and I'd do it for a full hour with them. Or, um, but that series of matches they had then were, were fantastic. Um, Whew, there's that many. My favorite live match that I ever saw was in South Africa, which was, again, Marty Jones against Gamma Singh from Calgary. Really? Gamma was incredible. Um, if you watch him from the, the, the Stampede stuff, he, wor- he worked as a villain. When he was a wrestling baby face, we got to Durban. It's an outside show. And they were on main event. I'd been on early. It, about five, it was always a walk-up business there. About five o'clock, 
it started torrential raining. Uh oh. By the time we get to the show at seven, there's like usually there'd be probably four, five, six thousand there. Uh, it's a tennis stadium. There's probably a thousand die-hard fans, right? They go on last in torrential rain with all the fans moved up into a stand, a covered stand, so there's nobody sat around ringside at all, just empty, except for me. I went and sat in the rain, pouring down, and they did 12 five-minute rounds straight through with no Jesus. falls. And it was like that scene in that film Paradise Alley, you know, at the end when they're, like, slipping on the water and, like... Yeah. And they, they just work, and I'm, I'm like... I'm totally in awe to this day of, of, of what I, I witnessed that day. I've never seen it on... There's, uh, n maybe it's on a, a film somewhere because there was one just, just turned up on YouTube recently I had no idea it existed my first ever time in Durban um, in 1980 1989 there's a full match of me and, uh, and there when I was 20 so somebody may have filmed that match that, but it, it was at in the rain Right. I don't know if I'd want to watch it because it might not hold up right. to my memories and that, right. that would ruin it for me but that um, whew, what else have I seen I've seen that. Well, I mean, what did you think about going back to uh, shoot? What was it, WrestleMania three, the, yeah. the Savage versus Steamboat match? Uh, this is a weird one for me, um, and I know why. Yeah, I, I loved it until I talked to Ricky about it. Right. Okay. Enough said. Because I know. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, and uh, it really put yeah. me off. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I still love it. If you, if you just watch it now for what it is, yeah. and, and I mean, it's it's. For wrestling fan standards, it's one of the greatest matches of all time. Incredible. But what we're talking about on the inside, yeah. what we're talking about. Uh, as far as uh, your, your your stay here in the States, or you know when you was over in uh, in England, your favorite world champion uh, body of work in, here in America? Because you get different guys. You, you get guys that are, that, are, that are funk guys. You get guys that are yeah. race guys. You get guys that are flair guys. You guys get a Michaels guys or a Bret Hart. Uh, are you, uh, where are you at on that? I have to say Ric Flair, I think. I just uh, just because... It, okay, know, now what was it about Ric Flair? Because he's my favorite pro wrestler of yeah, all time. And, yeah. and you're going to hear many people, uh, depending on what camp they're in, and, and, and again, wrestling is subjective. subjective. And people are going to say, yeah. if you've seen one Ric Flair match, you've seen them all. Well, that's like saying, if you've heard one... Uh, you know, Boston song or Led Zeppelin song or Metallica song, you've heard them all because yeah. everybody, you know, every band plays within their yeah. structure of what they do. Every wrestler wrestles within the framework of what they do. They do yeah. So why would you say Ric Flair in your estimation? That was the, f I didn't see American wrestling until two years after I was already wrestling. Right. right. Couldn't get any tapes. It was right. Just, right. You know, people forget that, you know, I didn't have a, I didn't own a video until you know, I was just leaving. Well, my parents had one just as I was leaving home. Yeah. We had black and white TVs when I was a kid, you know. It's that. Yeah. So I got some tapes, and it was one of the, the first stuff I got was the NWA from Charlotte. And so I've seen him go out there with all these people, and just something about him, just the way he did his stuff and the, and just the charisma and, the, and everything about it and just carrying himself like a, a pro and... Yeah, and then like I got to see. I, I see. I didn't see any. I saw all the best matches because that's the only ones right. I, I was getting. I wasn't seeing everything. Yeah, I was seeing the, the steamboat matches and and the Bruiser Brody matches and people stuff that was like, oh my god, as this fella just keeps going and and that was a lot of it as well. It's right. just the conditioning, right? And to be able to, you know, I can go a long time, but at my pace, right? His pace was twenty. Same with you. you. Your pace is 20, 20 notches above anything I've ever done, you know, because that's the way you were. And I, like, I'd watch you in these long matches with Rocky and with H and that, and I'd be watching. How do these fellas keep going? You know, like, Most of them I was blowed up, but I kept going. No, but you kept the, going. But the thing about Flair was, what I liked what he did was, you know, sometimes you need to take you down in a match. When it, when, and, and just, just, just by, by feeling it or listening or his instincts, he'd know when things that needed to be put in motion, time to speed yes. things up, time to shut somebody down, yeah. time to get a little heat, a yeah. little bit of hope, something. Yeah. His timing was just so good. And he did it within just a – you watched his body. He looked like a pro. <clears throat> he yeah. was so relaxed. Yeah. You know, he adjusted the trunks a little bit, put his hair back maybe a woo or whatever but just the way he executed his business yeah. and when time to, it got time to get nasty he was mean you know and he was kind of that you know that cowardly heel and i mean you know he, so he wasn't a tough guy and i liked i liked his but when it came when it came time to get mean he got mean what i liked was when i used to watch um 
the actual another thing that drew me to him was that, that the way he did certain things, and I, I knew he'd had some kind of a British influence, and then I found out later Billy no Robinson, Robinson came, yeah, because the way he put a wrist lock on was the proper way to put a wrist lock on, right? Instead of that old Chinese burn kind of yeah, thing yeah, that yeah. people do, I, I don't still get that, you know mm. what I mean? But he put a proper wrist lock on, mm-hmm. and little things that he did correctly. Right. I used to love watching Dory Funk Jr. And, and I loved watching Dory too. So I just like the, the the grinding and just the, yeah. the work. Yeah. At first, when I started watching Dory Jr. stuff, uh, and this was in a different uh, frame of mind back in the, you know early nineties. I mm-hmm. mean, I was like, eh, this guy's kind of boring. But as I got ed- educated to like what is great wrestling, I was like, oh, Dory Funk Jr. is one mm-hmm. of the best, and I loved watching his stuff and still do. I mean, all of his stuff uh, looked fantastic and totally credible. See, I. I I have an open, there's certain ways I, and I put myself in different times when I'm watching wrestling. Yes. I, I'll watch any kind of wrestling and enjoy it if there's effort. Right. I don't care if it's right or wrong. Well, people say there's right, there's no right and wrong psychology. It's just different. You go to different countries, they do things that you work for different companies, they do things a different way. But as long as there's effort. Right. So I look at, sometimes I'm looking at it from that. Right. If I'm in a mood to look at it from a, a, a point of view of, like, I see a lot of people, my thing was, and this is, I, I never, because I wasn't very good at this to start with, and I never bought into the whole, coming from a carnival and a show atmosphere and all that kind of stuff, it wasn't, I, I never wanted a, that, that term about being a good worker. Right. This was, this was the way I based my work on. I used to talk to loads of people, and I'm sure you do, who don't like wrestling, all right? Right. And when they used to say, well, when they, when people say to me, I still do, yeah, but when them, when them wrestlers do that, it looks, I, that was all I ever wanted to do was, I'm going to make sure my stuff doesn't look like that. Right. That was my whole outset, right. I, 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 mindset on, on how to make my, my wrestling. Interesting. And it was like, if you say that that looks phony when they do that, I'm going to make sure I work on mine until it doesn't. I'm going to make sure that whether you like me or not, when you watch it, it looks as believable as you can do, or if in doing comedy you understand that I'm doing comedy and it's funny, right. or if I'm t- everything is that much. If right. I talk, you say that all you ever hear from wrestlers is blah, 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 blah. Right. that's not what I'm going to do. Right. And there, or if I do do it, you're going to know that I'm. There's a reason for right. it. It's and there's a lot of thought out stuff. You know right. what I mean? That I've always thought like that. As far as getting in. I, I haven't got any, I've got no athletic ability. I, I, I haven't got, I can go my pace and I can do my stuff and I do it. And, and I've always think, avoid anything you can't do and do the things you right. can. And so I can't do that, but I can do this. Right. If you want believable looking wrestling, and I think I'm as good as anybody right. at it. That's just what I do. Grinding away and, and storytelling and stuff. If you want comedy, I can do comedy. Right. But it was, it's just watching other people and God, they're good at them. I marvel at people. I'm, I, I sit there marveling at people going, God, I, I would never think to do that in a million years. Right. I watched Sean. I, I watched when he, uh, especially when he came back in, uh, more so when he came back in 2000. And just, just that look and that, thing, yeah. that look in his eyes. And I'm all about believing. You know, yeah. I, I say this job comes down to three things. Whatever, it's got nothing to do. It starts in your brain, it goes into your heart, and it comes out on your face. And if one of them things is not right, right, people, some people buy into it, but a, a majority to, to really capture the masses, you've got to truly believe in what you're doing, right, and you've got to show it on your face, right. And if it's not showing on your face and through your eyes, and people go, oh. if you you can see into every, you never trust anybody that you can't, they won't look at you in the eyes. And as wrestlers, we seem to forget that everything comes through the eyes. We attract from that. It's that belief in yourself. And I, you hit it right on the head. I agree with everything you're saying about those three things. Sometimes these days, you know, when you can pick a, a green guy up who's trying to do those things, but the belief is not there, mm-hmm. and you see through them because they're overacting. And so I, 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 I totally get with what you're saying, but, but some people, when they don't really believe it, but they're trying to emulate that, mm-hmm. it, it's not the same. 
there's a big difference. And that just that's to me that just comes with you know learning the trade. Mm-hmm. Hey, we're gonna wrap this thing up. I know you got to mm-hmm. get down the road. Uh, yep. I'm going to download this thing right now as soon as we uh, get get through talking. I lost the last damn computer chip. Oh. Uh, we're here in Los Angeles, California. You're in my house. Uh, you're down in Los Angeles for another two days. Uh, there's a big cold thing going through, through uh, Atlanta. Yeah. Atlanta. You Gotta can't go. get back to the ATL. What are you going to do for the rest of your time here? Uh, you know, we were here for Monday Night Raw. I went down to Staples Center. You and I talked. I talked with a bunch of guys. Yeah. Saw Road Dog, Jesse James, Badass, yeah, yeah. Billy Gunn. A lot of guys had had fun hanging out. Got a chance to finally talk to uh, Bray Wyatt, good kid. Yes. Starting to buy into the gimmick. Yeah. Uh, he's got his head screwed on straight. Yep. And uh, what's the guy in the orange jumpsuit with the with the with the Wyatt family? Oh, um. I Rowan, met, Eric Rowan. Yeah, Eric. I met him yesterday. I didn't get a chance to meet Luke Harper. Luke Harper. Uh, you had some words with him. Yeah. He's going to turn up the volume. Uh, it was it was a good show. Uh, uh, Bray Wyatt caught a good win off uh, yes, that tag did. match. Ray Mysterio didn't hurt Ray Ray none. Vicious looking uh, gimmick out of nowhere. Yep. Clean in the middle. Wyatt's uh, uh, are, are speeding up the process. Uh, man, the show's changed a little bit, man. I tell you what, you go down there, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger, man. I went to see... Kevin Dunn in the production truck, and there's monitors. I mean, more monitors than there ever was. There was a pre-show going on. I mean, it's like I had to leave. There was so much going on, it was blowing my mind. Do, do, do I, I marvel. That's another yeah. thing. I, I sit around and I go, how do these people do this? I don't and know. I'm a part of it, and I'm yeah. like, how do, I, I, you just watch Kevin walk out for, he'll walk out of his, his, his yeah. truck for two minutes, and I'm thinking, I, I look at him, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, how does he do this? How does he manage to do it? What, what's, how, yeah. how, how, how brilliant is he that he can do all this? And everybody there, everybody I'm looking at, the production people, yeah. I'm going, how do they do all this? And Dude, I mean, all the together. wires that go running everywhere. Oh. And, you know, I, I used to always go talk to Kevin Dunn every time I'd go to Monday Night Raw. He's a friend of mine. But just the, the way the way, the way way it keeps growing, and, and they're feeding the, the you know the, the app, all the all the, uh, the different stuff going yeah. on. Uh, before we go, they're going to launch uh, WWE Network. Yes. I went down for the presentation in Las Vegas. It was badass to know that they've got 100,000 hours of original content, all this other stuff. Legends House is finally going to play. The reality show they filmed a couple of years ago yeah. and couldn't find a home for. I'm looking forward to seeing what happens with those guys underneath one roof. What are your thoughts about the, the launch of WWE Network and what it means to have access to all of this programming and content? It's just incredible, isn't it? I mean, I'm looking at it from a fan perspective. Cause I am too, because I'm a fan. Yeah, I'm a fan. And it's just like, there's all this, but it, you know, we, we probably take for granted what we've been a part of. But there's all this and stuff that we... I've most of the stuff I've been yeah, a part of. No, yeah. I don't want to watch my stuff. I just want to be able to type, type something in and have, have immediate it access. Because, yeah. I mean, it's going to blow YouTube out the water. Because it's, it's, you, it's, it's YouTube with, with slick sophistication and presentation. And I'm really looking forward. There's such a lot of stuff that I didn't see. Right. Because I, I couldn't get anything in England. Oh, you're going to have so a field I, I didn't see a lot of WWE stuff because I was always working. Yeah. It was only on Sky, and it didn't come on until the late 80s. Well... I was wrestling, and I certainly didn't have Sky, you know. There's, so there's a lot of stuff, NWA stuff, all that, all those territories that they own. That's what interests me, and that's where, yeah. you, if you're smart, you'll be learning from. If you stayed in a territory for a long time, you had to be good and do different stuff because you had to keep going back to the same places. And that's what I'm fascinated in. Right. What did these fellas do that stayed around in these territories for a long time? I'm, I'm, so I'll be picking, I'm, oh, why did he... Why, why did people buy into his act? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Was, and that, I'm, I'm really, I, I'm, my brain's going over time now about thinking uh, that's when I'll start because whether I use it or not, I'll give it to somebody else to use or try, right. you know, try and use that or try and use that. Well, that idea works. And there's such a big lot of new stuff that I can find, look about. And and just going back and watching stuff that you were, we were a part of and you, you can't, you forget that. You know, I don't, like I say, I don't want to watch any of my wrestling stuff. No, me I was either. never really that happy. Yeah, yeah. I've never been happy with it. Oh, I can watch my stuff and I cringe. Exactly. Yeah. But I'll go back and watch all the comedy stuff I've done because oh, I yeah, enjoyed yeah. all that. You know yeah. what I mean? Because that much of that stuff, that's my stuff because I, I, I pull off that and oh, there's a bit of Tommy Cooper and there's a bit of this. <laughs> and you, you know, like, it, yeah. so I'm going to, I'm like, but just to watch everybody's stuff and, and stuff that I, I never thought about before. Or I mean, you just get a thought in your head. I'm doing it every day. I get a thought and I'm Googling things, right, about bands or wrestlers and that. 
I yeah. can just watch that now, and that, that's going to be fantastic. That's the fact, nine ninety nine a month, and this, this isn't a plug, but I mean nine ninety nine a month to get all the pay views, including WrestleMania, and you're still going to get your Monday Night Raw, you're going to get your SmackDown on TV. I mean, you got fantastic. access to all this stuff. So anyway, it's going to be a, a, a badass thing, and so many guys have uh, before us. I've uh, paid dues. Yes. We did our thing, and you now the, the current generation is doing their thing, be a and lot the of people, people into the future. But you know, you know, uh, Steve, to to be good in this business, you know, because you did it, you got to live it, eat it, breathe it, sleep it. Michael A says this isn't a job; it's a lifestyle. It's true, isn't it? It is. And everything suffers because of it, unfortunately. But yeah. that's the way it is. You should know what you get. I was told my first day into this: you come in with nothing, you go out with nothing. Enjoy the ride, right? And and know what you're getting into, and that's what it is. You, 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 it's all time-consuming, yeah. isn't it? That's probably why I get two hours sleep a night because my head won't stop thinking about stuff. Yeah, whether it's for me or for other people, I just I, I live and yeah. constantly. Thinking but these cats right show. now, man, the the, the the current crop of cats that are entering right now, whether whether it's guy, guys or divas. I mean, guy, guys specifically. We're talking about the guys, man. You, you, you got so much time traveling. A lot of these guys in buses, or if you're not behind a wheel, if you're riding shotgun, or I mean, you can be watching stuff and and picking up uh, picking stuff. Up uh, stuff. Like you said, seeing what's working, listening to that crowd. Yeah. Uh, what's old is new. I mean, you know, so, hell, half the stuff that people used to do, nobody's doing anymore. Yeah. Uh, and just anyway, not to be late to, to uh, beat a dead horse, but anyway, you're gonna haul ass, go do your thing, shop in Beverly Hills, ride down Rodeo Drive. Did you get your convertible? You know better than that. I'm scared to death, me. I, I drive 40 miles an hour. I used to. What was all that about you? You mental, you driving. I used to scare the life out of me. We used to, yeah. Yeah, yeah you you yeah. are. You're mental. Yeah. That, that I'm, I'm, a, I'm a 70 days. mile an hour man. That's it. I don't go. Oh I'm man. Now, I'm, these I'm days, just, uh, I buckle up for safety. And if I get on the freeway, when I'm driving down to Texas. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm driving. You know, with, with a little bit of radar, maybe 85, but. I got the seatbelt in. I, I finally never go in a convertible because I've been in a car and had it roll on me. And, and I'm I, not a convertible the fan. That, the only thing that saved me was the roof. Yeah, yeah. So that was no, I don't dig that. Thought of, yeah, no. I'm not a drop top guy. Yeah. I got to have a, a ceiling over my head while I travel. Yeah. I'm gonna get a roll bar put in my stuff. Anyway, I'm talking to Steve Regal, he's got a haul ass, and I do too. Catch you down the road. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a Podcast One production. Download new episodes of The Steve Austin Show every Tuesday at PodcastOne.com. That's PodcastONE.com. Get around for Halloween with Pluto TV's 31 Nights of Horror. All month long, Pluto TV is bringing you the best Halloween movies, shows, and more. Watch classic horror movies like The Grudge or The Blair Witch Project. Or scream along with your favorite stars like Ryan Reynolds in life. Pluto TV has hundreds of channels with thousands more movies and TV shows. The best part, it's so free, it's chilling. No credit card, no sign-up, no fees. Download the Pluto TV app on all your favorite devices and start screaming now. What's up, everybody? It's all-star and World Series champ Nick Swisher here, and I'm stoked to tell you about my new podcast, The Nick Swisher Show, right here on Podcast One. If you know me, you know I've worn a lot of hats in my career, and each one of them has had highs, lows, and a whole lot of learning in between. And that's exactly what I'm bringing to this podcast. You're going to get crazy interviews with athletes from their struggles to their successes and all their unbelievable superstitions along the way. You're going to hear from hometown heroes that are stepping up to the plate and making positive change and influences in their communities. I mean, we've got scientists, coaches, comedians. I'm telling you, whether you're an athlete, a parent, a coach, or just looking for a little energy in your life, then Home Plate is right here. It's old school soul with new school vibes. It's the Nick Swisher Show, coming soon wherever you get your podcast. Yo, what's good? It's your boy, Big Brother Jake, a.k.a. Jake Warner. My government name. Check it out. I host a show called the Big Brother Jake Podcast, and I'm taking my talents to the biggest and baddest platform on the planet. 